Hello everybody welcome to our podcast speaking our peace and today we have with us Javier Lil Garcia from Spain who is a medical doctor in Spain and uh, Javier was a co-worker with me in Jagat 2020 and uh, a very dear friend a person with a warm heart and a great passion to serve humanity i welcome Javier and let's listen from him what is he doing nowadays how was his experience in the Jagat yatra and what he does so welcome Javier in the podcast and it's been so lovely to meet you after a long time you know talking i was very nervous about this interview but i'm really feeling very warm after talking to you and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself how have you been working as doctor now in spain in these corona covid situations mhm okay so thank you so much tashima thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, podcast <laughs> i'm really pleased to be here talking with you So yes as you said um I'm working now as a medical doctor in Spain so actually that's why I decided to come back to Spain from the march because the situation in the month of march it was like very difficult in Spain in terms of the epidemic and the situation of the health system uh, because there were like many many like uh, thousands of infected people and also of infected uh workers so there were very few doctors at that time so yeah when we received the news of the march being postponed yeah they said to go back to spain to contribute to that and to work as a medical doctor so it was a uh, funny in a certain way because i had been out of the medical work for two years like doing many other things on the march among them so yeah i you know one day uh 15th of march i was in armenia uh in the middle of the march and only uh, a week later I was in a huge hospital uh with a thousand uh, infected people in Madrid, you no? So it was like a very uh, big and quick uh, change. So like many changes going back to medical work, going back to Spain within the march, you no? Know? So at the beginning it was uh it was not easy all the time, like all those changes at once, but at the same time uh I was saying this to you earlier. I had the same feeling that brought me to the march, the feeling of uh contributing to whatever was required of me. Let's say that I I decided to join the march moved by this feeling of uh, receiving a call or having like a mission or a higher purpose to to join the march and I had this very same feeling so that made things a lot easier for me uh, in this moment of going back to Spain. And then uh, yeah I've been working since then since the month of March now and uh, things are quieter now. The situation is much better. You know in the in those months it was very dramatic. Yeah, that's yeah. really nice to hear uh, Javier that situations are getting better in Spain now. Yeah, and you are still continuing to serve your medical doctor role still and yes. uh, but we really really want to know like how has been your journey from being a doctor to coming to this march has been you were a doctor practicing medical and then like you said that since two years you were doing different things so tell us a little bit about that and how you got involved with the march so i was doing the specialization in what here in spain is called family medicine so i finished that in 2018 so by that time uh, since maybe 2014 i got in contact with a collective in madrid which is focused on promoting the culture of non violence Uh, and actually it was thanks to them that I got to know about uh, Jagat March because uh, Raja Gopal uh, he came to Spain in 2014 so I didn't have the chance to meet Raja Gopal at that time but I met some people that met him so it was like uh, through these people that I got to know about Raja Gopal Ekta Parisa Jagat and also I got involved with them and we were doing like a, many activities in Madrid it was like trainings in non violence and also some kind of actions uh, in the street um, with um, different topics and different uh, issues actually i was always like very much interested in social issues and uh, somehow medical work is very good in a lot of ways because you are like helping a lot to the people but in a certain way uh, i don't have the feeling of going to the roots of the problem let's say that uh, many uh, health issues the causes or the origin is in the social situation no in the context so let's say that uh, some person or some people come to my uh, consultation and ask me because maybe they are not sleeping well 
because they have like some uh, problems at work. So all I can do in front of that is giving pills. So for me, that was like quite frustrating. And um, I was like feeling more focused on social work, on social issues, because for me, it's like the roots of all the health problems. So actually, during those two years, I started studying like social sciences. Also, I was very interested in meditation. Also, I was very interested in uh, group facilitation. For me, actually, since the first moment I, I listened uh, about the march in 2014, I knew I would join the march. That's what I meant earlier when I was talking about this uh, feeling of following a call. See, it's not like a proper decision that you are making in the way that we usually make decisions, no? Like you can say, okay, I want to do that or I would like to do that. But in this case, it was like different. It was not something I could choose. It was already chosen <laughs> for me, see? So there were like many things in the march that was a powerful call for me. So that's basically how I I moved or my journey from medicine to the march through this collective and also through this feeling about the medicine, which is not actually going to the roots of the cause, to the roots of the problems. That's really nice, uh, Javier, because I think we have talked about this in the march also, but I think that our audience should also understand this. And uh, I really feel that maybe you can put more light on these aspects of how our illnesses are deeply rooted in social problems and what you digged in deeper, like what are the social issues, how mental health is also impacting the illnesses, how we just combating the illness by just giving pills and not really, you know, understanding the root cause of it. So mm -hmm. can you uh, talk a little bit about it? Yes. Maybe the easiest way for me to explain this, uh, to mention one research that was done like many years ago. Um, basically, they tried to establish, let's say, um, what are the factors that explain the uh, burden of disease of a population? So they basically got to the conclusion that there were like four items that explain this uh, burden of disease. And uh, one of them was the uh, quality of the health system. Second was the genetics of the population. Third was the lifestyles. If people smoke or don't smoke, if people eat healthy food or unhealthy food. And the fourth thing were the conditions of life. Let's say the quality of housing, the quality of jobs, the quality of uh, urban planning and many things, or the quality of water, air, some cultural aspects also. So basically they got to the conclusions that uh, almost 80% of, of this, of the burden of uh, disease, was depending upon lifestyle and conditions of life. See? And only like a very, very small percentage was depending on the quality of the health system. And even though whenever we think of health, we always think of health system. Yeah, and uh, whenever we want to have more health, it seems that we have to invest more on more pills, more hospitals, more that but actually it's only like a very small percentage that is depending on the quality of the health system. So if to speak about health, we have to speak about many other things, not only, I mean, we can speak about hospitals, but also of, about many other things. And then we get to think about, okay, is this economic system promoting health or not? How we move in the city, bicycle, car, whatever, is this promoting health or not? Or uh, is this the political system promoting health? Is the educational system promoting health? Like everything, we can look at it from the health point of view. So, and also like many cultural things, the way of life, the way of thinking, like many ideas, role, uh, gender roles, many things, no? For example, the, the roles um, according to age, no? What is the role we are giving to elder, for example? No, is that promoting health? So, and also the mental issues that you were also mentioning, of course. So basically for me, for example, meditation is something that can go to the root of, I mean, not to the root, not to, not to the social things, but at the individual level, it's a promoting health a lot, more than many other pills. Yeah, that brings me uh, like, you know, I remember now when we were doing the march, once we were uh, passing through a village and there was inauguration of a medical center. And then mm -hmm. you had talked about this research and everybody in the audience, like the village people and all other people were like surprised because there were other students also from the school that mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that, okay, 80% of the problems lies in the cultural aspect or the ill life lifestyle uh, we have. So now maybe we can come to this point, uh, like because you have been one of the two doctors in the march. How was your experience in the march? What was your expectation from the march when you joined it? And how you felt uh, during the march? 
Mm-hmm. As a doctor, you mean, or globally? Uh, normally, also, and also, maybe you can specifically talk about your role as a doctor, also. Oof, what can I say? I was uh, thinking uh, before this interview that uh, talking about the march, it's a difficult task for me because it's like such a complex and a rich experience that it's so difficult to talk in just a few lines, in a few sentences, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, about the expectations I could have about the march before joining the march. Luckily, I think I didn't have many expectations. Actually, I didn't know how, you know, many things. I didn't know actually we were going to walk from the first day because there was this option that, that the international group, we were going to join uh, the walking group later. No? But finally we joined from the first day. So I didn't know that. I didn't know in what kind of places we were going to spend the night or uh, in what kind of places we were going to eat or what kind of food or what kind of uh, how uh, we would have to organize everything now so like uh, I had like a very big big uh, lack of information so that was very good because I didn't have uh, many expectations so I was very much uh, uh, surrendered to whatever it, it had to be no so and even though when I finally reached the march everything was as I was imagining it Because in a certain way, I could imagine something, no? <laughs> even if I was not expecting it or I mean, I couldn't be disappointed because I was not expecting anything. But somehow everything was just as for me as it had to be. Everything was in its place. And I don't know, I was feeling so much in my place and everyone was so much in his or her place in the match, wasn't it? Like uh, everything seemed perfect, no? <laughs> just as it was. And then, um, wow, the experience in the march. It was like a huge transformation, I think, of ourselves as a group, as individuals. I think that we learned so many things. I don't know, the kind of uh, experiences that transform you forever, I think. If I can say like a, one of or a few of the many things uh, I learned, but I guess that I stepped forward in terms of engagement for the social change, I think. So maybe before the March, I was very engaged, but somehow it was just like a part of my life. No? There were like other parts, like a work, family, friends, whatever. No? But then this uh, purpose of social transformation came to the center. And I think that now everything is uh, related to that somehow. I think that that's the kind of experiences that you can never be the same as you were before. Because you have been there. I mean, we're going to be one year, but finally we spent six months sleeping, you know, the 50 of us always together, walking together, eating together, like doing everything together. And it was like a total experience, no? It's not like a, you are in your house, then you go to a place, you learn something, and then you go back to your house. There is you know, something out and then something inside, no? Which is uh, different from that. But in this experience, it was like everything all the time, no? Like a public space, private space. It was all the time uh, being there. Yeah, I think that I learned also so much from the, the marchers, finally, from... Uh, every one of you <laughs> and uh yeah my experience as a doctor you know i think that i worked more as a doctor in the in the first weeks and then i guess that people were more used to walking so they didn't have so many injuries so many blisters so many pain but it was it was very good and by the way i learned a lot from uh my colleague uh, namrata <laughs> because she is more focused on ayurvedic medicine and also i could learn a lot from this other way of Uh, understanding medicine. Yeah, so there was another doctor with us, Dr. Namrata, who was uh, trained in Ayurveda and mm. uh, Javier is trained in modern medical sciences. So it was a really nice uh, combination of two doctors and they were really together sorting out all the medicines in the <laughs> in the bag and uh, always telling that, okay, you can take this and Javier mixing new medicines with the Ayurveda mixed medicine. So yeah, those were some of the memories of the month. Yeah, also this uh, brings brings me to part. Javier, do you remember some incident from the March, like how people were feeling in the initial month, like they, when they used to have pain in the leg or blisters? Can mm-hmm. you share with us one or two incidents? Uh, so, you know, maybe luckily among the marchers, there were no like very big issues. It was more about blisters, you know, like uh, every day uh, many people had blisters. Maybe if I can remember something that I took with me back to Spain, it was giving assistance to uh, some people from the villages, you know, because I guess that they had like very scarce medical access or access to medical facilities. So they had like very 
big issues. Maybe because they, they didn't have the, the assistance of a doctor maybe since uh, months, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I remember like uh, some children, like uh, they were brothers. They had like a very bad skin infection. I had never seen that. You know, it was like very big and in a very bad condition, in a very bad situation. So that's the kind of thing. So, so I, I gave them the kind of antibiotics we had, which were useful, but I'm not sure they were enough for them. I guess that they needed a lot more. Yeah, I sometimes think of them, of those children. And uh, the, maybe the other uh, situation I, I have kept uh, very deeply in my mind, it was this Hindu monk in a temple. It was a very small temple. I remember we uh, had lunch there in a very, very sunny day. It was maybe in the first month or maybe starting the second month of March. And he was very old. And, you know, his aspect, it was for me as a Western uh, person, it was like very uh, strange, no? with only the dotty, And he was very slim, very thin, and with a long beard, with the long hair, orange color, and with many colors and earrings and many things, no? And he was just like that on the floor. And it was so interesting for me to see some a person so different. But at the same time, when I started talking to him, thanks to the translation, I could see that he had like the same problem as I could have or as anyone in my country could have, no? So I um, listened to the heart, to the lungs, uh, touch his belly, everything. And, you know, maybe this conclusion, it's uh, evident, but it's nevertheless impressive to see that everything was uh, just as it is in anyone else in everyone else, no? Like the heart was the same sound, the lungs had the same sound, you know, the belly was exactly the same and everything was in the same place, you know? So like someone, a person like so different, apparently, to me and uh, inside it was like perfectly familiar. So that was a very, yeah, a very nice experience. You know, it's like a, we are all one uh, despite the differences, no? Or the differences are only superficial. Yeah, I think that is one of the most beautiful learnings of the Yatra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think when I'm talking to you, it's getting reflected a lot. Like your spiritual journey and these realizations. As a doctor, you study human body, mm -hmm. the anatomy. And sometimes we feel that by race, by appearance, we are so different. But internally, we are just so similar. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I remember you always searching for people if there is somebody ill and like sometimes Javier used to be so tired but I remember there was this girl in the in a village and she was so ill burning with temperature and Javier was so tired still he went to the van took his bag and you know because there was always a problem of translation so He's still in that tiredness. You tried to understand that girl. She was so small. She was crying. She didn't want you to inspect her. <laughs> but you, you were just so empathetic towards her. And you just tried to listen to her. Really, really listen to her. And what she's going through. And give medicines to her father. And give the prescription. And all. And also I remember one of the, your quality. That you never used to give pills unnecessarily. You would say that, okay, in one or two days, it will be okay. Mm -hmm. Just give it some rest. I have rarely seen those doctors. And sometimes because uh, people are so used to take medicines like instantly, like you just give them a prescription and medicines. They used to be like, why this doctor is not giving us medicine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's very yeah. deep, Javier, with the thing you are talking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, actually, what I was saying now about this, um you know, that inside the body was the same. Uh, I know it, it is obvious somehow everyone, everybody knows that, but it was like very impressive nevertheless to see that. And uh, yeah, you are right also that um, I could see that in India, there is a little bit of this culture of receiving pills. Yeah, I had some sometimes like this difficulty because I'm, maybe I'm not used to give so many pills, no? And maybe ma many things, th there were no pills for that, no? for many issues. And even though it seems that the people were somehow disappointed if uh, there were no pills <laughs> for them. That's right. That happens in Spain also, but maybe maybe not so much. They have done a good job, the pharmaceutical industries there in India. <laughs> yeah. They have promoted this culture of pills. You're right. Yeah, so much dependency on uh, pharmaceuticals and medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That happens everywhere. Huh? No. To, to that. Yeah. So I think that intrigues me really because uh, you you are such a spiritual person and then you understand medicine and then you understand this intersection of different things. How you see these 
this world going right now and uh, the impact of that kind of lifestyle or that kind of culture on what we are receiving today in terms of pandemic or in terms of environmental change or in terms of uh, increasing social disparity what do you think abhi mhm so what i think about this culture we live in i guess very much everywhere but i talk about spain which is what i know it's a very violent culture and uh, what i think is that the root of this violence is uh, how we have learned to be disconnected to the things around so that we have get to a point where we believe that we are just individuals and that we are therefore like disconnected from other people like other humans but also like other animals and other other beings and in general of the reality around no uh, so I, for me that explains yeah finally the violence for example the violence to nature or the violence or that explains inequalities or that explains violence uh, from the north against the south and like any kind of violence or also violence to our families or to our friends or to our neighbors no so for me that has been like the great change for me that's why for me like social change and spirituality they go so well together and that's why among other reasons that why i like no violence because it's like a very holistic uh, way of understanding life and it's a very for me perfect integration of spirituality and social transformation so and actually that's one of the messages we were like talking again and again in the march right this message of unity just a few days ago i was talking about the march to some friends and they were asking me about the the mottos that we used to the sentences we used to to shout no? or to sing when we were like coming into the villages and the cities and they were so beautiful i really like to remember this uh, because one was who will join one heart to another heart yeah. <laughs> and the answer was we will do it now we will join the hearts this is what i mean like a heart unity no it was one of the gandhi's purposes no heart unity and i think it's so beautiful and it's so so important uh, in terms of uh, eradicating violence and also all the other three pillars no including climate change and uh, inequalities and social exclusion so, yeah mm-hmm. i remember that you have learned a lot of hindi also so javier was the only international yatri who had learned a lot of hindi and he used to sing jai jagat song in hindi Uh, in a lot of places yeah mm-hmm. and it's very interesting to see the slogans we mm-hmm. have chanted all along the yatra and uh, how they sometimes yeah. come to our dreams and you know like we remember them and see their significance now also the, this other uh, motto which was very simple but very powerful this joro joro dunia joro no yes it's like uh, who will join a uh, join 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 the world yeah no? connect the world connect well, yeah i mean yeah Yeah. Yeah, in our connect mm-hmm. yeah. and um what else also this uh no one left behind no this was also a, another motto not that we used to sing but we used to talk about that yeah. and uh jaya jagat victory of all is the same thing so it was like the one a very central point this point of of unity i think and for me like uh yeah. this path the way of meditation or spirituality in in any way i think it all this spiritual tradition finally end up in unity to everything else and by the way if i can still say this that's one of the or a very good learning i i got from the march uh from you uh, people from india i think that in in the western countries this connection from one individual to others and to the world and to nature is even uh bigger than in india i think or at least i think that you have a bigger sense of of the collective mm-hmm. of the group and we could see that again and again uh, during the march and i think that's like a great learning for us westerners i think for example during the march i learned to to look at the situation from the eyes of the group not only my eyes which uh, are always there because they're my eyes but to look at the situation like a more like a, in a systemic way and then you can understand yourself not only in terms of what you like what you don't like or what you feel like or what you want but what is necessary for the group so then if you are just a part of a group and then you try to contribute to that and also that's uh, very powerful in terms of a spiritual growth mm. yeah. this uh, idea of service uh-huh. you know sometimes i feel that only when i talk to people who were in yatra i re- really realize it how much it has 
changed me or other people in the yatra until mm-hmm. unless i don't talk about it i just feel that okay i just did it for 6 months and i just came back because of covid but when i really look into it i realized that okay this was a point like nowadays i'm really feeling this idea of aswad we were talking in armenia that we have to just eat to feel that okay we have to give something to our body so as to nourish it but we don't have to think so much about the taste uh, or how delicious it is oh yeah you know yeah, yeah. and the tastelessness yeah huh. yeah tastelessness and i really feel it like i don't have any desire within me to eat very tasty food i will just cook with my heart and i will just cook whatever is given uh, i will just eat that with lot of happiness yeah those are small things so we just adapt into it i think or we just learn and we don't realize it and now you mm-hmm. are talking about this thing about the shift of going towards collective from individual position is really mm. really strong yeah yeah actually this notion of things being sacred that was for me a very important learning from the mart i mean everybody and also me before the march i knew there were sacred things but during the march we could see the sacred like every day for example it was this attitude no of, for example this tastelessness which is at first difficult to understand maybe the word is not is a little bit difficult just like that yeah it's not very attractive but actually for me as i understand this word or this concept is about considering food as something sacred yeah. so you are going to honor food regardless of the taste so and then you are going to appreciate that yeah regardless of the taste so it's not only about the taste about your pleasure no it's about something bigger maybe yeah. also it's like the difference between when you are looking at nature that kind of beauty is not just something nice or pleasant like a movie or like a, no it's something different it's something that takes you beyond where you can actually again like connect to to something else no to nature to the to the world that kind of beauty was there Yeah, like i'm really not getting anything in my mind now like think about yeah, these yeah. things uh mm. <laughs> it is it is really big if if we can really be aware of these things i don't mm-hmm. know till when we will be aware of these things of but uh, like how do you feel after this six months where you walk where you interacted with so many people you were in a different country in a different culture and then you went back there was a cause also for which you felt like calling and you worked there how do you feel now when you feel that oh i was supposed to be on a walk for a year and now that has been suspended so as i was saying earlier maybe for me there was it was not a big problem to to quit the march i mean i was so happy mm. in the march but at the same time i mean it was just life no <laughs> i mean <laughs> and it was something really big uh taking us away uh, or taking us back home so i was actually you know in the march like every day was different so after six months we were so trained to accept any kind of situation because some days we were a little bit comfortable but many days we were not and many days there was noise and many days there was i don't know it was very hot or very cold or <laughs> or we were so many people in a small room and so actually for me it was just like the same thing no it was okay everything every day was new so we learned to accept any situation or whatever life brought us so for me it was again just accepting whatever life was bringing to me and again like uh, looking at the situation and seeing what i could be uh, what could be my biggest contribution in that in the in every situation so Yeah when the march finished for me it was just perfectly fine it was curious at least because in the past i have done like a, a smaller trips maybe one month the longest and whenever i was back home everything seemed like very strange and it was like wow this is home and i was feeling very weird back home but curiously uh going back from the march i was feeling just absolutely normal you know when i was back home and even if it was like a, a very long trip and a very you know far away trip and all that and i think it was just because of that because in the match we learned to move or to be in the to flow with whatever the situation is right oh. so actually that made things a lot easier at this point now it is true that after four months already in spain maybe uh just like medical work I, i'm not feeling so much like the purpose of doing this or maybe i think i could do like a bigger contribution right because now i'm working very hard in the hospital in the emergency department of my hometown here in burgos so 
I feel like a, a bigger call to contribute to social uh, issues, as I mentioned earlier. But I'm working very hard, so I, I literally don't have time for anything else but working in the hospital. So yeah, maybe I think I will have to move to maybe reduce the time, the amount of work, <laughs> if I can do that. In the coming months, I think I will be able to do that. And then um, I'm thinking of starting some kind of social spiritual project here in Burgos with some friends. Wow. I would love to hear about Javier and I would love to help you in any way possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's true. Everybody of us feeling the same somewhere because that seed has been sown and mm -hmm. uh, we know that there is a calling for it. So I really, really wish you luck because now things seeming to be feeling a little better in, the, in your country mm -hmm. and maybe you can spare some time for this thing and then maybe shift towards that. So do you want to say something to our audience maybe because you have done all other yatras also so maybe a message mm -hmm. to them if they want to do something like this in their life what mm -hmm. do you suggest or what do you will say to them mm -hmm. okay thank you <laughs> for <laughs> the opportunity maybe my message would be i would encourage everyone to follow uh, the call firstly to listen to the call because sometimes uh, life is so crazy and so busy that we don't have the time and the silence and the space to listen to that call. So firstly, like give yourself the time and the silence to listen to that. And secondly, to follow that call. And how easy was it for you or difficult was it for you to be a successful doctor and then leave that and take this path? Well, now that I'm back to medical work, I am, so to say, paying the price of doing that no? because I quit it for two years. So it was a very long time without doing any medical work. So now going back to medical work is not so easy no? after two years. So at the beginning, during the first weeks here in, the, in this new job, yeah, it was difficult. I had to study all the time, all the time, like all the time studying, yeah, like working very hard to go back to my previous knowledge and my previous capacity. But I have never had the smallest thought of regret. See, it's like, okay, now it's hard. It's the price I had to pay, but it was for me so clear that I had to quit medicine for a period of time and to follow that call. Now the call is like bringing me back to, medic to medicine or to medical work, but it's just fine. I mean, I'm not asking life to give me only pleasant moments. No? <laughs> there are also hard moments sometimes. I guess that as long as it's the same pathway that you are just like following, then everything is fine for me. I'm feeling so nice talking to you, Javier, because I see that graceful acceptance of the harsh realities of life, same mm -hmm. as you have accepted and followed your dream and your calling to go and do whatever you wanted. I'm really, really wishing you all the beautiful energies in this universe and, you know, all the warmth from all of us I think all of us miss each other and uh, yes. people who would be listening to you after some days on this podcast they would also relate to you and they will also send you so much of love so do you, do you, you. want to say any finishing lines mm -hmm. yeah maybe just I encourage everyone to to know about more about Jajagat and about it's not about Jajagat because it's our initiative but about about non-violence about Gandhi you people you have it uh, you know, for you, Gandhi is so close, but it can be non-violence and also other non-violent leaders. I think it's something that really, really, really changes your life and the world for the better. And to me, it's like a unique philosophy or ideology, which is based on love, finally. And yeah, maybe for me, it's uh, one of the very few um, ideologies based uh, on love, right? <laughs> Most ideologies are based on uh, ideas about power yeah but there is not only like a philosophy and a way of understanding how to change the world in terms of love and that's maybe what makes non-violence for me in my opinion unique so yeah i really encourage every, everyone to to be interested in non-violence and to yeah and to know more about that thank you javier i know that with this many other memories also coming because you have worked with social theater also which works yep. on this whole idea of power and now you are talking about Gandhian idea of love and philosophies of social change which talk about love as it is mm -hmm. uh, yeah but maybe some other day we would talk about that those experiences mm -hmm. of you also okay <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. non-violence also talks about power of course <laughs> but also <laughs> about love right yes. about both mm -hmm. yeah. There is the power of love also. Yeah, that's it. <laughs>
thank you so much javier for being with us on our podcast speaking our peace and you can follow javier or you can write to him on his email id which javier will tell you mhm yeah it's um i will spell uh, j which is my first letter of javier and then my uh, surname which is uh, leal l e a l g a r c i a j leal garcia my family name and then at @gmail.com thank you javier and you all beautiful people out there you can listen to this podcast contact javier for any of your queries he's a wonderful wonderful person being in spain now and i hope that one day he would complete this peace walk or some part of it and continue his yatras so all the best to you javier it was so so nice reconnecting to you thank you and all the best thank you ashima good night good night to everyone